guest is Bruce Hughes. He is a stroke survivor. He has had to face something we will all have to face one day. But here he is to tell his story with humor, passion, insight, and something you can't just describe somehow. There's a spark in him that is spectacular. Hope you enjoy the conversation. <clears throat> I sat up all night with my hand held over and just willing it. And it started just from a little trickle like that. And within 24 hours, I could bend them. And she came in to see me the next day. And I went, this is what I did last night. And she was so impressed. Like she, like every day they were like, we can't believe how you're responding to this. We've never seen anybody do this. And uh, I said, well, then study me. You know, let's let's make this, you know, this procedure, and I said it then, game changer, and I was glad to hear Dr. Blackier, Blackier use that uh, terminology on Friday's announcement, because in my mind, I could see this benefiting yeah. others, and, and even though it was such a rare stroke, <clears throat> not all strokes could have it, yeah. um, there had to be someone else out there like me you yep. know, that would benefit. And, and there's another dimension to add to that wall. Science can do what it does and medicine can do what it does. There's there's the Bruce Hughes factor, <laughs> you know, because yeah. because of the uh, this stuff that Chopra talked about, that, yes. that intangible thing that science will never be able to measure, but is the seed of our energy or this, where we come from, that initial spark. Fear is a wonderful motivator. <laughs> <laughs> I've always known that, but it, this is in a new context because it was... It was fear at first. Like, when I first came to, it was so scary. Like, I mean, you don't know where you are. You've got this giant tube down your throat, people around you. You know, I'm trying to explain. And my wife finally figured out. She's like, he wants that damn tube taping out of his throat. And then this nurse leans in, and I can see her face. And she's like, you know, talking like I'm deaf or something, you know, the doctor will take that out at 10 or 10.30. And as she pulled away, there's a giant wall clock right there. And it's six in the morning. <laughs> so I've got to lay there. That's why I say I stared at my elbow because I knew if I started focusing on the tube in my throat, it would drive me crazy. And I, you know, the, the minute some limb worked, yes. I would try and drag it out. Yeah. So I had to occupy my mind just to keep myself from scaring myself i guess you yeah. know it, it fear is powerful that way or the flip of that would be the love part it's like no friggin' way i'm i'm gonna do this well i don't uh, love a life maybe i i something i drove. think the fear factor was was big at that time because okay. my wife and my mom were there and one thing about a stroke uh when it happened you had your emotions i mean i would just oh my god i would think of my poor dog and burst out crying or my mom would walk in the room and I'd start yes. crying and apologizing for it. And you're just emotionally a wreck, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, you learn later, it's all part of the stroke because of the way your brain is swollen and, and the part of my brain that it affected. And uh, and just over time, but, but you you're know? At, Yes, M much respect for that. But you're, you're at such a, a major threshold. I mean, we all have, we'll all come to that threshold one day. And, and to not force of will, because that would be like the common language. I'm after something more intangible that we haven't tapped into for a long time. Yeah. About who we are, where our spark comes from, uh, that thing that makes us us. And so it was almost like an invitation to, in these circumstances, Mr. Hughes, what are you going to do? Yeah, challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I spark a challenge, sort of. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, 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 that's not my... Uh, I don't really spend a lot of time on that. I, I attribute it to fear, being very strong-willed or stubborn. I, I say people say, oh, you're so strong. I'm like, well, no, stubborn is probably a better <laughs> word. My mom would probably agree with that and my wife. But um, fear, stubborn, and just great doctors. You know, like this province, I mean, you were a small province, we're a have-not province, this and that. But you look at what those surgeons and, and radiologists are doing in St. John. Uh, Dr. Boma, my neurologist here, she's a New Brunswick girl. Um, just these are top shelf, world class people and they saved my life. So, I mean, you're not gonna catch me saying anything but really good about them and, and attributing their 
uh, profession and the, and they're caring and they're you know in my case they had to go in and put a heart stent to repair that uh, artery and you know oh there's a complication on the way what are we going to do to fix that oh well let's take this part well but that's for a heart oh well but it might work over here and to have that confidence to try you know instead of going oh well that's not what the rule book says you know if they'd have followed the rule book i'd probably be dead right but they're going you know we've got to try it and look at the benefits now it's they've extended the guidelines there's going to open it up to 24 hours you know so i think he said they're figuring like a couple hundred people a year that they can now save or or save them their family the grief of major de de debilitation uh you know there's always going to be some but it could have been a lot worse you know and should have been like uh that article you know i keep coming back to it the uh, catherine and did a great job of following me around and covering the story but the opening line in that article bruce you should have died right you know when i when i see that <laughs> it kind of still just saying it gives me a chill because i should have you know but good doctors and just good circumstances and that unknown yeah <laughs> You touched lately on it. Um, this province has an awful lot of skill sets and an awful lot of talent. We don't have many places to tell those stories. Yeah. Our healthcare system might be a lot better than what mainstream media tend to portray it as. Do you have thoughts on that? I know you had a particular experience, but also you, you've been in and around. Yeah, I, I, I'm in that hospital quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure everyone's experience is what guides their judgment or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I've seen nothing but great, you know. And the way I equate it is, yeah, you can gripe about, you know, too long in the emergency for a cold or your kids are there or whatever. You know, my wife and I don't have a family doctor, so we were totally at their, you know, I needed help throughout this entire process with everything. Uh, a, I didn't understand. B, I couldn't do anything about it. And C, I had no doctor. So to to see what I saw, or, or you know, from my point of view, is uh, put, your life in, put your life in their hands, and we got a darn good system. Yeah. You know, and this procedure and me being here proves it. In my, in my eyes, you know, and a lot of other people I know too, because I've, I've realized... We've got to let people know this is out there, yeah. you know, that that the neurologists at, at our hospital, at Dr. Everett Chalmers, are just as good as anyone in the world. The, the guys down in, uh, and girls down in uh, St. John doing the heart and brain stuff down there, they're world class, yeah. right? I mean, they rewrote the guidelines that they announced on Friday, right? This is going to be huge all over the world, in my mind, and I hope for a lot of people that just... It's another option on the table to, yeah. to save you. Yeah. And I can see the, the in their faces when I see them in reports or, or interviews and stuff, they're nervous, but, but they're darn proud, sure. you know? And I always ask, I don't care who the nurse, the doctor, whatever, I would always ask them, where are you from? Yeah. And I bet 99% of them were from right here in New Brunswick and they wanted to stay in New Brunswick. And I thank them for that, every one of them. Yeah. I, I would just thank them. I couldn't tell you how many of the nurses and stuff, you know, just from the bedroom communities around here. And they're like, no, I want to stay in New Brunswick. And I'm like, wow, we're lucky to have them, you know. Good. How are you doing so far? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take a turn? Uh, because we're tied to healing, it is music. Sure. And one of your other great... Oh, I love music. One of your other great passions. So how long you been a guitar player? Uh, I bought my first guitar in 1979. And I didn't get serious about playing until, oh, for about five years. So I just kind of picked around. And then I uh, I decided to go back to university. I was living out in Alberta and B.C. and places around, you know, moving around. And, and I thought, it's time to go back to school and finish off my degree because I had, I had left here and went to the, one of the big oil booms in the late 70s, right? I, I think it was in my third year when I quit here. And uh, I thought, I'll go out and work. So I worked a few years, and then I decided to go back to university and went to the University of Lethbridge. And uh, while I was down there, there was a guy I knew from a band here. He was the McCain's rep, um, and we shared a house together. So 
you know, on Sundays we do what we call rock and roll housework. So we put a record on and strap our guitars on and want to vacuum, want to be doing the dishes or something, and a song and come on. He say, okay, now here, you know, C, G, D or whatever. And that's how I learned. And then I taught myself after he moved out. And then when I moved back here, I got into, you know, started a little band and playing parties and this and that. And then eventually we got to the point where we were getting invited to play clubs and, that went on for, oh, from the mid-80s till 99. <clears throat> and then I had had it with the music side of it. You know, we'd done some recording and some pretty big shows, and I was kind of the business side of it, and, and it just got to me, yeah. you know. And it, was it enough to make a living on? Oh, no, this was a side project. The, the early band we had, we were all teachers. We all worked in schools like at... Uh, Dan was a music te and still is a music director over at Presque Isle High School. Alan has his own schools over in Maine, charter schools. Um, uh, Dave Cunningham worked at uh, UNB and I worked out at Upper Keswick or Woodstock or some of the schools in town. Like it was our side job, you know. And but back then it was like you know, it was a good second income. Um, the days of doing it for a living. I believe are just about over, you know, and unless you've got a whole lot of original stuff and you don't mind touring, you know. But, but music is an interesting thing in the brain and in the body mm -hmm. to loop it back to dealing with a stroke and in recovery from stroke. Mm. Because music also has that intangible in it. There's the mechanics of the notes and yeah. the structure of a song. And then there's always something bigger than all the sum of its parts in a song and the way it all connects in your brain so do you have a way of describing what it was like when you when you picked up the guitar again and and you talked a little bit about your fingers and your hand technique but but the other side because something happens when you hold a guitar or hold your instrument and and you morph or you shift and you become this player i was hoping it would do that but it didn't ah no uh it was horrifying because the stroke affected my right side. My leg didn't kick in until probably August, so I just basically drug it around, and David will tell you. And, and I have bad knees and ankles from our basketball days, so it, it gave the uh, physiotherapist fits. They actually sat me down and thought we were going to have to get braces or maybe do operation. And I was like, no, I'm, you know, let me at least get back to some type of walking, and down the road we'll think about that. But uh, the occupational therapist, Amanda, said, well, why don't you start bringing in your guitar? And I said, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I want to do is, is see, you know, I'll make that my therapy instead of, you know, doing woodworking or painting or whatever, you know, the communal things they have you do in rehab. I said, that's not for me. You know, this is my piece of wood. I'm going to work on this. Yeah. So she said, yeah, bring it in. So I brought it in, it came, like I would go home on the weekends and come back on Monday or Friday, and I brought it in. And the first time I took it out of the case, I couldn't even get my shoulder up. Like, it was so fatigued. And the left hand's okay. I only, I only lost about 10% on my left side. And five minutes. And I couldn't hold a pick. I couldn't strum. I couldn't, and it was just, I put it back in the case and never touched it again that week. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll wait till next week. Maybe I'll be better next week. And then the Monday came, she said, did you bring your guitar? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, play it for me. And I said, oh, wow. And one of the, uh, one of the things they have you do is tap your toes together. Well, it's still to this day, I'm almost there but it's not there yet. So my coordination isn't perfectly back yet, but it was like, <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay. <clears throat> so we tried to come up with stuff. Um, she had all the, our, our, it was called, not a grab bag, a grab box of hmm. things for me to do. And we couldn't find anything that would simulate playing. Hmm. So she, she found the, uh, it's amazing little thing. She took two little medicine cups, taped them together, and took some dried rice and put them in between and made me a little shaker. And that was about the closest thing to strumming 
that I could find. And that's how it started. I just sat there shaking it and I couldn't, you know, it was just back and forth, back and forth. And then over time I could chick a chick a chick a chick almost like one of those rhythm eggs. And, yeah, well, that's what I said. I said, oh, maybe I should get an egg. And then I, and I said to my wife, no, she made me this. I want her to remember this for the next patient, right? She's so creative that way. You know, she's like, well, if we don't have something, let's make something. You know, because I just couldn't find anything that would simulate it. And they said, well, it's just going to have to be playing. I thought, well, until I can control my arm and, you know, my coordination, it's not going to happen. So that was probably the hardest part of everything is no matter what's happened to me in my life since 79, I've ha I've had that guitar and I could sit by myself and write a song or, or just play it. It's therapy, you know, in itself. And I couldn't do that anymore in what's argue well no arguing about it my most trying times the one thing i had is now you know the biggest challenge and i'm still not back at it. i'm back to band practice and we and we did uh we did a show uh december 1st tom petty tribute and that was a lot of fun um one of your former guests was there too sleepy driver and there was a whole bunch of bands and everybody was like, wow, you guys are really good. And I said, yeah, but I can hide in a band. <laughs> right? yeah. If they stop playing, yeah. I'm pretty horrible still. Yeah. So it's going to take some time, but they've been great about it. And uh, over the winter, we're working on original material and uh, giving me a chance to rehab that way instead of, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we, we haven't mentioned the name of your band. Yeah, the new group's called The Unheard. Uh, I just love playing with these guys. This is uh, Vaughn Evans on lead guitar, uh, Charles Wilby on drums, and Bob Fitzgerald does most of the singing and bass for us. But the three of us sing, and, uh, you know, we're more of a rock band. The old band was blues, you know, like I did at the festival and stuff, hmm. uh, the Blind Dog Days. But uh, The Unheard is a rock band, and now we're starting to do our own material. And I just, I can't wait until we're ready to come out, you know, We've got a few gigs lined up for the summer, but we're always looking for gigs. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a YouTube? Not, not yet. No. We have just like a Facebook page because we're not that active right now where That's I okay. can't, you know. I could probably maybe get through a set right now, but there's no way I could get through a whole night. Okay. Like just the fatigue factor is just too much for me, you know. Yep. I'm full of energy right now. Yeah. But <laughs> Eight yeah. o'clock tonight, I'm pretty yeah. pooped. But but the mental and physical focus needed for playing an instrument and then playing in a band when listening to everyone it's it's pretty intense. Yeah, it's I'm having a harder time than I thought it would. Like the boys, you know, they're very encouraging and and very forgiving and and, and they just think it's amazing what I'm doing. But in my mind, I'm still like, you know, come on, like yeah. get there, right? It's like another, enough of this sitting around. Yeah, it's, <laughs> another, it's another version of walking to the end of the hallway. Exactly. <laughs> but but now, um, what I used to see on almost on a daily basis of improvement, it's like monthly or biweekly kind of thing. And it's just a, a bit more frustrating, I guess. Um and I got to get back to where I was at least because, you know, I was just a rhythm player that wrote. I mean, I'm no fancy hot shot lead player or anything. So if I can't even do my rhythm parts, you know, what's the point? And, mm. and I'm not, not, I can sing, but not a great singer. So, you know, mm. but I'm hoping to get to uh, back to where I was because I just love playing with these guys. And we have just such good camaraderie and chemistry and, uh, I just want it to work, and and I, I really can't wait to get this original material out there. Great. We'll take another turn, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, another one of your passions, I know, are politics. Oh, man. Provincial politics. <laughs> you so, and I have talked politics. So be gentle. Okay. <laughs> Watch your language. Okay. All that good stuff. It might be, as we go into an election this year in Little New Brunswick, that... Mm -hmm. um, the ground might be kind of open for something new to happen in this province that's never happened before, which would be the idea of a minority government. Yeah, I'm a big supporter. Um, there is, an, from what I get for feedback, there's an awful lot of frustration with the two-party system. It was percolating 10, 15 years ago, but seems to be reaching a different critical level this time. It's also five choices, as well as independent candidates. That's going to mean the province, uh, the voters, going to have to do something that they've never done before. Um, Forty percent of them are going to have to show up instead of opting out, and then have a different range of of awareness yeah. that you do have these choices. Yeah. Um, 
you've been following this for some time. Do you want to play in that space a little bit and, and share what your thoughts are? Well, it's it's funny you bring this up because, I mean, I have a degree in psychology and political science, so I've been a news and political yeah. junkie all my life. And having the stroke got me out of that cycle, like that daily cycle of following the news and just caring and ranting and, you know... And so now I almost use it as humor, right? Like, I mean, for the American side, I'll turn it, uh, like, I'll look at my wife if we can't find something, and I'll just look at her with this grin and say, let's look in and see what Trump is doing, you know? And we laugh because, and albeit nervously. Um, so, so I don't have, it has changed my take on things, but from the perspective of New Brunswick election and that feeling out there that you mentioned, I'm totally supportive of that. I, I think we would benefit from a minority government because uh, the two-party system and partisan politics just in general, I, I, I'm a believer in the independent, you know, candidate. I, I, I often considered that myself, but I think it was like you're only allowed a $100 campaign limit or something like that. And thank you for watching. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.